Yeah. Does anyone need a, qu- uh, a sheet of the questions? I do. Yeah, I, I'm pointing at them. I just put in a copy of my book here. You're starting at 15? Yeah, it's a good place to start. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Before 16? <laughs> Before 16. <laughs> Welcome to Kirkville United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Brian Holman, and uh, eating a wonderful peanut butter cookie <laughs> with beautiful frosting on it provided by Sharon Starr. So mm-hmm. those of you who are joining us at a distance, I'm going to pray for you because you don't have the privilege of eating this wonderful cookie, but I do. So, and you'll also notice we're keeping social distancing, and we have some three friends here. Uh, my wife did take off the mask this last Sunday that you had in one of the bears because she put it in the basket in case someone needed one. But uh, we welcome you if you're joining with us at a distance. We've been studying the Gospel of John, and uh, today we're going to be looking at John 15, and hopefully John 16. And uh, we have a few chapters to go, because actually we started uh, with talking about the resurrection appearances, so we're not going to review those. So once we come to the resurrection, we're going to be switching and begin a series on the Gospel of Matthew. And what I'll be doing is every Wednesday, we'll be taking a section of the Gospel of Matthew, and then on that Sunday, I'll be teaching on another section of the Gospel of Matthew. So we have consistency all the way through, and that's also to encourage folks who are visiting us online to uh, visit us on Sundays, and we hope that you will at 10 o'clock in the morning. The bears have been made and are being sold for $25 a piece. And the money from the bears goes directly to the uh, Center for Exploited and Missing Children. And so we sold quite a few. We know the holiday season's coming up, and if you would like to, uh, you'll find in the newsletter that's going out this week um, that you'll find who you can contact, and we can then make sure that you have reserved a bear for yourself. Uh, our sanctuary is filled with a lot of bears. They help to give us social distancing between one another on Sunday mornings. But as we begin, I'll put my cookie down. I may be tempted every once in a while. If you'd like to uh, uh, call in with any questions or comments regarding our study, you may do so. Uh, instead of calling, I recommend that you text. And that's uh, 315-345. Six five three four. That's three one five three four five six five three four. Enough being said. Let's pray. Gracious, loving, and giving God, we thank you for this day. Today we woke up with rain, and now we're told that in breaks of sunshine we can expect a lot of wind. And gracious God, we just ask for your protection for those who have been suffering with fires those who are suffering from the threat of hurricane, for those who are suffering with a battle with COVID-19. We lift up all those persons and the ones that we've had that we've lifted up and prayed for prior to our broadcast, and we just know that you are aware of their needs, even as you are aware of our needs. But we ask that where we can make your presence known, that you might call us that we might be able to truly respond. You may not be the solution to someone's need, but yet we know that we can be your hands and feet with them. So Lord, open up your word to us that we might have greater understanding. Open up our heart that we might appreciate the truth. And then strengthen us that we might live out our commitment to follow you fully. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. So we're looking into John 15, and I'll turn your attention to that. And hopefully I've I've posted our questions, some of our questions on email, and also on our two Facebook pages, my personal one and the church's one. But we're looking at a very famous passage of Scripture, chapter 15. Most of John is pretty famous uh, or known pretty well. People may not know where things are exactly located, 
but there's a lot in the Gospel of John that people are aware of. It is probably the most quoted of all the of the Gospels, except for Matthew, maybe, with his uh, the Beatitudes and such. So we look at uh, the story of the vine and the branches, the teaching of Jesus on the vine and the branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And though that's only four verses, I'd like us to stop there and look at those verses. Um, and I want to point out some things. I know we have some questions um, that I asked, which is, what pain would be involved in pruning? Really, not, not pruning, but being pruned is the uh, real question. If uh, it is said that we are going to be pruned, if you're truly connected to God, the Father, through Jesus Christ, so Jesus said in these opening uh, sentiments that we're, we can expect we're going to be pruned. It's, it's a very specific task. You have to do it just right to accomplish the after result. Okay. So pruning, if done wrong, can damage the plant, Correct. or it can also help the plant bear fruitfulness. Correct. Now, I want to take that analogy because that's a good point I didn't think of. Sometimes in the body of Christ, we try to prune one another. God has given me the wisdom to prune this person. This person's got some weaknesses. This person's got some frailty. So it's God's calling me, since I'm aware of them, that I'm supposed to prune them. And the problem with that is, is we don't necessarily know whether God is asking us, really, that we are to be involved in that pruning. God may. But we have to be very careful about involving ourselves. Because when we prune, we may do it the wrong way, and we can cause more harm than we can. Right, because that, that, that could hurt individuals, and you, don't even, and you don't even realize that you're hurting them. I've seen a lot of people who are well-meaning in faith that um, while there may be some obvious weaknesses in others, uh, wound up becoming more offensive and hurtful and damaging to someone's faith than helpful. And that's and, their weakness. Pardon? And that is their weakness. That is their weakness, yes. Very true. Yes. Usually I've found that someone who is uh, being pruned oftentimes knows that they're being pruned because of uh, there'll be a disruption in their own life. And then they might approach a trusted believer with their circumstance. And that, because of invitation, we then have the opportunity to add our two bits. But wherever we add our two bits, God expects that if we are going to um, help in pruning someone's life, that we first are pruned ourselves, okay? and uh, which means that we look at ourselves and are willing to have our motives checked, how we do certain things, how we respond to another person, so that we make sure that we truly represent Jesus Christ well. And I think that's an important thing we do. But going to that, uh, the question really was, what pain would be involved in being pruned? So think of the times uh, that you feel that God has pruned you. Um, how did it feel? Probably something you didn't even realize was a problem. Okay. Make you feel uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. When God has worked in my life um, without someone else coming in to help in the pruning process, uh, I've usually found that prayer has become difficult. I recognize the distance from God. And that void that I feel 
is actually the Holy Spirit uh, trying to get my attention. And there are times in which I might feel that void or that emptiness in which it has nothing to do with God pruning me. But maybe God drawing me or beckoning me to draw close. And because I need to draw close. But I'll find an emptiness. I also will find a time of guilt. I don't need anyone to point it out. I feel guilt. And I may not be able to specifically identify what's the cause of that guilt. And I need to identify that because there's false guilt, self-imposed guilt, and there's true guilt. Sometimes we don't like to be criticized, but sometimes the criticism can help us. So sometimes we feel, okay, or we feel sensitive to sensitive. criticism. Or overly sensitive. Oversensitive. We anticipate and we read into other people's uh, responses to us. Um, we overread into them. And it's really a reflection of what we feel inside. But may not be willing to face. Okay? So there's a certain amount of guilt, um, a certain amount of emptiness, a certain amount of frustration, uh, a certain amount of, I don't know what to do. Especially if there's a situation that's going on over a period of time, or more than once, where you've given it two or three or four or more chances, and that you feel like, well, I, I can't change myself, and I can't go know how to react. Okay. All right. That's a very good point, Charlie, saying that, that there are times that it's been going on for a while, and we're at a loss. What to do next? Because we tried, and you've, even, and, you've even, and, you've even, and you've even taken it to God in prayer. So sometimes healing, sometimes things happening to us takes a bit of time, and sometimes we want immediate changes, even within our own lives, and that's frustrating in itself. Why? I've been working at this, God. You know, <laughs> help me. <laughs> Uh, is a very important thing. What specifically might God prune prune from our lives? Self-importance. Hmm. Self-importance. Okay. What else? When we think we need more than we do. You know, oh, I need a bigger house. We need a bigger power. We feel we deserve it too. Right? Yeah, we deserve it. Yes. Yeah. So we feel entitled. That's what I was trying to think of. I uh, see someone it. else. Boy, look what they got. Well, I'm, I, I should be able to have that too. We feel entitled. And that goes back into one thing that I do every, every night in my prayer time. There's several different things I do, but one of them is that I go through the Ten Commandments memorize them, I go through them, because automatically when I find myself um, envious of what someone else has or what's happening to them, I automatically know that's the 10th commandment, do not covet. Okay? And I can also look at uh, one that oftentimes speaks to me is do not make for yourself any graven image. Now, we usually look at that as being what, what graven image? I mean, you know, statue and stuff. We look in the Old Testament, we see they're, they're pretty delineated, pretty But clear. it could also be belongings. It can be belongings. Or an activity. Um, it can even be a person. Um, our, our graven images can be things that are very subtle and we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be. Um, for some Christians, it could be uh, a pattern of worship. And what opens us is to realize when we experience worship um, with people of different cu cultures that God is very open. God is more uh, concerned with, number, number one, the, the conveyance of truth, okay? and then also the spirit. You know, Remember back in John 3, those who worship me will worship me in spirit and truth. So, no matter what the music or the liturgy has, if it's truth, that's good. And spirit is that, is it motivated from the proper motivations? <coughs> Not just sincerity. Or passion. You can be passionate about something, 
but passionately wrong. Okay, and so that's that's an important thing to realize. Okay, so what other things might we be be uh, pruned? Uh, might be of a sin that we do not want to uh, face. Taking the negativeness out of our life. A negative attitude. Faith is to be positive. And that's something which I think is a very important with uh, we look at this COVID-19 that we're facing and some other things. We can always look very negative upon them. But God is always doing some it's, great things. It's got people lost and confused. It's got people begging, in my opinion, for love and trying to get an understanding. And it's like, but they don't know who to go to. They don't know who to ask. Okay. They're frightened. So, um, not because I, you know, uh, I just bring this up. There's a comment that the president made regarding not let the COVID, fear of the COVID virus dominate you. What I think that I heard that I think that he meant <coughs> is not that we're not supposed to be concerned. Um, but yet, we can allow something to destroy the other aspects of our life, and we can stop living. And I find that when I'm dealing with counseling with any person, depending upon the crises that they're facing, the first crisis that they have to go over is that of fear. Um, because fear leads us into a good re response, but fear can also lead us into um, an inappropriate response. Um, panic. Some people enter into panic. And you make wrong choices in that. So also in our lives, when we feel the absence of God, when all of a sudden we see this, the, uh, this prevailing uh, struggle with a particular sin, then that becomes um, a danger when we just, okay, I'm trying to avoid it because of my fear instead of facing it. It may be something not just of sin that we have to surrender to God, but sometimes it is the pruning is um, that we haven't surrendered something to God. I don't know about you, but I've been in some services when I was younger, not recently, but in which all of a sudden uh, I remember a time in which I had 20 bucks in my wallet and I felt the tug of God, okay, that's mine. Um, and, and are you going to willing to surrender that? Mm -hmm. And there's a struggle that I had. There's other times in which I've had a struggle that um, there's this person. And, and do I really want to give my time in this way to deal and be involved with that issue? <coughs> Go ahead, Charlie. I saw it. I'm going to give you a chance to, to swallow your gum and give it your drink. I, I like the term realignment. Okay. I, I think that through this, it, it's teaching us to maybe realign ourselves. It's like when all this is done and over with, however the time frame may be, only God knows that, that we've learned that certain things need to change, certain things have to change. And, it, and it's, it's not putting anybody down. It really isn't. It's, it's, it's just understanding that the rich and the poor or the or, or you, you can... You could turn that over to politics too, the R's versus the D's, but I don't. I don't like to think about that thing. I just call it a realignment of things, and especially within the within the church and Christianity, we need to love. We need to put keep putting God and Jesus Christ first. Amen. Uh, now to go also in this, it says, "I am the vine." Jesus is speaking yes. of himself. Yes. I yes. am the vine. Yes. Which my Father is the gardener. Right. So that if we're being pruned, we're being pruned by the Father, by God. Not Jesus Christ. Um, so to think that through, what does that mean? He cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit. So if we're settled in our lives and in our faith, we are not going to bear fruit. That maybe even the, the very fact that we're not bearing fruit that we could bear mm -hmm. is something that God is pruning. Does that make sense? We get settled with our religion. We get settled to what we experience, what we know. Mm -hmm. Of course, not you folks, because you're waiting to be part of a good Bible study and you know, right. challenge yourself. Right. Right. Um, but we get settled in what we are familiar with. And sometimes God challenges us, and it's uncomfortable to be challenged. 
so that we will grow. Because unless we move from where we are, yeah. we cannot bear more fruit. And that's what this COVID-19 has unfortunately caused on people. It's taken away all the fun and the things that people were able to do. Well, God eliminates the branches that aren't productive. Mm -hmm. He gets rid of the people, the disciples that aren't really truly disciples and aren't doing God's work. Okay, that's an interesting thing that you bring up. So, um, so it goes on, I think that's right here. Um, uh, right there we're talking about so that we can bear more fruit. And he says that you are already clean because of the word so that if we are truly given to following Jesus, we listen to his word and we are already clean. Okay? Um, because of the word I have spoken to you. So the only way that we are able to remain clean is to remain in him because he's the vine. He's not the pruner, he's the vine. So whenever I'm feeling lost, I feel like I'm wandering, I feel like I'm struggling, I'm disappointed in myself, I'm disappointed in other people, I'm disappointed, discouraged by circumstances, where do I need to go? I need to make sure I'm hooked to the, to the vine. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's the only way that I'm going to get through the pain. Mm -hmm. So the Father causes the pain, Remaining in the vine is a is a sure way that we're going to. Now I remember the vine, give, the vine gives us strength coming off of the father. Now I remember my part of my personal story is when I was a, a senior in high school, I wandered away from my faith, and I came back while I was in college. And um, a lot of those emotional experiences I had, feeling of lostness, the feeling of wandering, uh, disappointment, discouragement, um, all those things. And um, the only way, uh, though God didn't necessarily resolve all the questions that I had, uh, I came to the point that I had to return to the vine. I knew I needed Jesus, and I needed to get close to Jesus. And the answers came slowly and gradually, and uh, some may be also still waiting to be <laughs> answered, uh, as sometimes I still get disappointed in the institutional church. Sorry, Bishop, if you're watching uh, but I do. Um, I think other people do as well. Other people give up. And I found I had given up, but I needed to come back. See? Be connected to the vine. Go ahead, John. You were going to say something more. No, I just, I, I, that's, that, that's my take. I just think that we get, so, we get so comfortable with the way things have been and we try to keep things the way things used to be or fall back on history and stuff like that, but sometimes you've got to allow new things, new pruning to come in, to come into your vine. Okay. And, and, and then, here's especially the with religion. Here, here's the thought for you. How Go many, we, we have that proverb saying, yes. necessity is the motherhood of invention. Gotcha. Okay. How many of our advancements could we say, both personally, spiritually, culturally, how many of our advancements came because, oh, we just want to grow, we want to improve, we want to progress? Or how many came because of responses to circumstances? Who's in control of those circumstances? But God. Okay? So all of a sudden, there's a cancer to fight. Well, you know, I'm not saying that God said, okay, you're going to get that cancer, but it becomes an an a possibility, uh, a place where we can grow because we wouldn't challenge ourselves unless we face that. Uh, our friend Ron Peckham from Men's Bible Study will oftentimes remind us that it is in the point of crisis that we will experience the greatest growth. doesn't mean we want to say, bring when it you, on, God! When you, when, you, when you find yourself starting to fall off that train track, you got to have you got to have some sense of something to pull you back on. Yeah. And if you don't, yeah. you're headed for disaster. You said something about how when you were in high school, you mm -hmm. kind of wandered off and you came back. So if you wanted to do an analogy of like the vine, you've been pruned and it's cut back. A lot of times, that dead vine that's been cut back, all of a sudden you see a little sprout coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's happened mm -hmm. in my gardening. I mm -hmm. mean, I'll think, 
something is dead, but just something tells me, oh, I'll leave it for another year and then we'll cut it back. And then oh, so it's something will come back. And I kind of feel like maybe that's how we can be. Mm-hmm. We're kind of pruned back quite yes. a bit, but we can come back. Now, Bonnie yeah. mentioned something that kind of disturbs us a little bit. Um, and that comes in the next section. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have to wrestle with that. It's supposed to make us uncomfortable. Right. I am the vine, verse 5, mm-hmm. you are the branches. If a person remains in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's something worth memorizing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, wait a second. I can do something. The problem is, is when we think we can do something, we do it on our own. You don't do it jointly with love for with others. You don't even realize what the others are doing. I see, especially in the work world. You know, I can I can tackle many different problems just on my own ingenuity, which is also a gift of God or capabilities. But uh, he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to be connected, even when we're trying to use the resources that God has given us. We don't take credit for the resources. God has given those resources to us. And when we supplant uh, God's um, enablement for us to be able to meet those challenges and take credit for ourselves, then we have we are severing ourselves from the vine, at least I feel. He is like a branch, this is a little bit that is disturbing, uh, that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So, with your comment, Sharon, if we pick up those dead branches that have been pruned and they're thrown into the fire, can they blossom again? No. I wouldn't think so. (laughs) (laughs) Once you hit that fire. So, what's, what's, you know, so while we're still on the ground, (laughs) give them another chance. (laughs) We may have a possibility. But there is this warning that if we persist, in being separated from Jesus, if we persist in not allowing, uh, making uh, making use of the pruning, the circumstances and that God has allowed in our lives, if we don't take opportunity from those, then what happens is that, is this saying that we could lose our salvation? We get cut off. We get cut we off. We get cut off from salvation, or we might be. Okay, Pan Mackey. In 1334 and 35, God tells us to love each other as he has loved us. In verses 12 and 13, whoops, God tells us not only love each other, but love them so much that you would give your own life for them. I got to open that up. My glass shield, protecting shield on here is, sometimes prevents me from opening things up. Um... That's, that is what Jesus did, the ultimate sacrifice. And that's what he means that we should also be um, doing for one another. I think uh, her comment is coming from another question further down, uh, on our, which we'll get to. So the question there is, our, what should we take from that? If it's thrown in the fire, it can be burned, it cannot be saved. But even the okay, I don't want to read Devil's Advocate. But but even the ashes go are going back into the ground, which something might come back out of that ground. Mm-hmm. Well, they could fertilize the ground. There you they go, fertilize, fertilize it. it, and fertilize it, and something so it's not will totally grow. gone. Something else may grow. Back something and different. Something different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Provide fertilization for something. Mm-hmm. What this serves for with me when I first came back to Christ. <laughs> is that I read that in a Bible study with some friends. It made me, when I left that, even while I was in that study, and when I left and went home, went to my dorm room, I was afraid. I didn't want to to be tossed in the fire. And from that fear, it was a good fear, not a bad fear, I then asked myself and asked God, what do I have to do? Mm-hmm. And the answer came in, remain in me. 
Um, so for me, that warning, I'm never going to be able to, I'm not going to point to someone else's life and say, ah, you've been pruned, you're not responding to the pruning, you're not bearing fruit, so you're going to hell. That's not for me to say. But these words are to me to be applied to myself. I have to be concerned about who I am, where I am, before I should be concerned about someone else. So if I'm feeling that I'm being challenged, and I'm wondering whether you know, I have gone too far, then the simple answer is return. You know, draw close to me. That's the most helpful answer that I have found. And then, all of a sudden, you can bear fruit. Fruit that glorifies Jesus Christ. Fruit that glorifies God. Um, if you remain in me, my words remain in you. And the only way my words remain in you is if you come back to me. And my words are important to you, right? right. You can ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to me, my disciples. Now we got to go to that question again. Ask whatever you will. So, okay, God, I've come and I've asked you a lot of things that I didn't get yet. But he's the one that gives the answer, and you may not like it, but God is the one with the final answer, just like Jesus is also the gatekeeper for our final step into heaven. Yep. And it's well, a narrow gate. There's a lot of people that's going to take that out of context. Yes. They're going to read, well, all I have to do is ask for it, and he'll give it to me. It says so. Right there in the Bible. Right, right there in John. You see, but go ahead. There, that's what can maybe drive some Christians nuts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, is that they take one little verse and read it, Mm-hmm. And then that's it. Yes. And well, he didn't give me what what I wanted. So you tell me there's a guy? He told me he'll give me whatever. No. What, what is it that we're supposed to be asking for in this passage? This is the context. What are we supposed to be asking? Asking for things for others. Okay. As the father as the father loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. Not material things. Keep not, my commands. Right, not material you know, things. Answer the material things. The ask whatever you wish and I will be given to you is in the context of bearing fruit. Yes. So if all of a sudden I want to love this person more, I want to do honor God, I want to, and you're making it difficult for me. I but just that, don't have that feeling. But that's your wish that may be not what God knows you need. You see, what happens there in this passage is I can ask. If I want to ask for more love, if I want to find a way of being able to express that love to them, Mm -hmm. God will give me that answer. Correct. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, it may not necessarily mean that if I love them the way God wants me to, that it's going to be reciprocated. Right. Right. But I'm not responsible for how someone else responds. Right. I'm responsible for how I respond, how what I do. So we ask, and what is the fruit of the Spirit? Um, you know, in Galatians, this is all of a sudden what what um, Paul shares with us. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, okay, um, faithfulness, you know, self-control. Now, if I need self-control, and I've had that pray for that, you know, praying for that self-control is a sure way of getting self-control. One reason why is I'm stopping and saying, I'm getting out of control. I'm being tempted to get out of control. That's not going to help the situation. So I go to God, and just in the process of going to God, I've delayed my response. And then I can allow the Spirit then to come in and give me a proper perspective and give me a sense of control that I wouldn't have on my own. And let you rethink the whole situation. That's right. So love, joy... Peace, patience, Jesus. long-suffering. So if we're looking for the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, if we ask, Jesus promises it will not be denied to us. It is a guarantee. See, the problem is what we ask for. Most people read that. 
quote, and as Sharon said, they misunderstand and misdirect it. That, you know, I can get what I want. They want it all, and they don't want to share it. Oh, I can even say, I want vengeance in that person. Oh, God. You know? Oh. Vindicate me by making it bad for them. Right. You know, and we oftentimes find that in the Psalms. But the reason why they're that way in the Psalms is because by releasing that and seeing that, we then gain yes. a yes. perspective. Yes. We then realize this is not necessarily what God wants us to do. Angelina, welcome. Question. Then what does it mean all of God's promises are yes and amen to the glory of God the Father? And that's from another passage of Scripture. Good one, though. Because by being yes, that means that they're for our benefit and blessing. God's answers, even my death, okay, is a yes. It keeps it, it keeps it po in a positive frame of mind. Am I saying that wrong? No, no, I think that's that's true. Okay. What happens is realize that, realizing that we're God is die. for us, not against yeah, us. Yeah, we're all going to die. Okay. And that, uh, and this from, uh, yeah, yeah, quote yeah. is from yeah. the, one of the letters of Paul's, okay. um, that it is always yes for us. Okay. It's from the Corinthians. Okay. Um, that even when we're being pruned, yeah. disciplined, okay, that, that it is always for our good. I want to take you just uh, as a bypass Go ahead. to the book of <laughs> Hebrews. Okay? Hebrews. Hebrews. Yeah. <laughs> How did Moses make coffee? Hebrews. Oh, oh, boy. Yeah. I think I have it on a cup over there. Yeah, it's on the cup over there. <laughs> I don't dare take it home. <laughs> Chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Charlie, because you're closer to the mic, I'm going to ask if you'll read that. Read it. Here at verse one. All right. Okay. At the beginning. Five T's put here. Uh, yeah, I got it. But okay. 12 here what? is uh, Hebrews. Twelve what? Twelve one. Twelve one. Okay. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, perfecter of the faith, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him endured such opposition from sinners, you might grow weary and lose heart. Good, verse 4. In your, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement addresses you as the father addresses his son? He said, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship at the discipline. God is treating you as children. What children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined, then everyone will undergo discipline. You're not legitimate true sons and daughters of all. Okay. Now, it goes on to describe that we all, all of us have been disciplined by our earthly parents. Um, how much more should we expect to be disciplined by our heavenly parent? So in other words, we should expect that if we're following Christ, if we're seeking God in our lives, we will be disciplined. We'll be disciplined. We'll be more sensitive. I love that hymn by, by the Wesleys, uh, Give Me a Sensibility to Sin, <coughs> okay? Uh, a, fear to, a, a feeling uh, of uh, awareness to feel it near, um, because what happens is that um, there are those who do not follow Christ who will trample on holy things. They are able to do things that um, and not feel guilty for them. And we kind of shake our heads. How could they do that and not feel any shame? Have, have you ever asked that mm -hmm. of yourself? And then I find myself oversensitive. I can walk away from a conversation... And all of a sudden I think, oh man, why did I say it that way? Or I should have said this. There's an oversensitivity. There's grace if we're oversensitive, in which all of a sudden uh, the Holy Spirit may say, it's okay, Brian. You know, I'm in that exchange. I will let the truth be known. Trust in me. Don't trust in yourself. 
At the other hand, it also helps me to learn. We we'll learn from this. You'll have another opportunity to be able to address this again. Okay. Um, but it's also it is by having that voice and that struggle within me that a lot of people who call themselves Christians avoid shows that I'm in Christ. If I'm in a relationship, then I'm going to experience that discipline. I'm going to be sensitive to that inner voice. My conscience has been awakened by the Holy Spirit. And so one of the things that I fear as a follower of Jesus Christ is if I don't sense that uh, questioning of myself. And that is something that bothers me. I want to feel his presence. And to feel his presence means that as I go in prayer, all of a sudden I say out what I'm going to say, and if I'm honest to God, and all of a sudden this little inner voice that says, oh, come on, Brian. <laughs> and, that's what, and, that's, and that's what I've really been learning myself over the past couple of years is how important it is to do it each and every day. Yes. Constantly. Yes. And you, you, don't, you shouldn't be pushing it to the back burner. And this is one of the things that says in verse 4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now, shedding your blood is a painful and um, uh, thing to do. Especially if you're diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think about some of the th sins that I struggled with and are struggling with, and I said, I just can't. I just can't. I just can't defeat it. I can't overcome it. So I'm just going to accept God's grace, and I'm just going to let it go. Then all of a sudden, things like that remind me, have I, have I fought, resisted, hard enough, until it's drawn the most out of me? Have I really given it all, or have I drawn the line short of what I could do? If there's someone I've thrown my hands up with, I've done with them, I've done my best, God forget that. And that's all of a sudden when that little spirit inside will say, have you really? I went to the cross. I shed my blood. How much have you shed? Ooh. Ah. Ooh. So it deals with my, both my relationship with other people, but also my relationship with myself. Right. And the, but then, but then yeah, the more you talk with fellow Christians, the more you get an understanding of yourself. Mm -hmm. And hopefully help yourself as well as mm -hmm. those others. So going back to John 15, mm -hmm. verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. So even if I'm feeling beat up, distraught, disillusioned, out of energy, what do I have to do to get that back? Remain in his love. Because where I cannot, he can. Okay? If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. So in other words, sometimes I, I just don't want to do that. I remember um, a couple of nights last week, I just, uh, on my routine that I have defined with God that I should do for right now for my evening compline, my evening devotions or whatever. I said, man, I'm tired. I'm not going to do that. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, we made an agreement. <laughs> so I sweat it out. I may not feel so comfortable with it at the time, but as I do it, I relieve that circumstance feeling good. That if I hadn't obeyed, I just want some of these good hymns. You know, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And <laughs> obeying is not always easy. Right? They, um, that happened to me oh, probably not even a week ago. Doug and I worked outside from like 8.30, quarter to 9 in the morning till it was probably 1 in the afternoon and I couldn't believe it was so late but we cut back everything and, and I had poison ivy up both arms to oh, no. but, uh, and I went to bed that night and I, I mean I was I was exhausted and, <laughs> and I found myself apologizing to God I said I know I'm going to fall asleep as I say my prayers. <laughs> and it's one of the last things I remember. I knew I was going to go, and I thought, I should have done this sitting up. <laughs> but you know, you prayed, 
<laughs> God gave you a good sleep. Yeah. <laughs> he did give me a good sleep. I think I slept at like 6 in the morning and I never do that. I don't feel sorry when I'm reading and I mm-hmm. and the Word and I fall asleep uh, for very long. I don't feel bad about it. Or or if I'm praying and all of a sudden I drift off in the la la land because I'm trusting that God's taking me there. I, mean, so. I just knew I was so I apologize so far. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's going to happen, yeah, so no, here you go. Uh, and then he goes and says, uh, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. To, to shorten that, if we want to have joy in the Lord, it only comes to obedience. And I know that the closer I've come to Christ, when I'm more aware of my disobedience, I don't know this full of joy. And usually I transfer that on over to other people, <laughs> like my wife or some other people, and they don't let me get away with it. But anyways, um, you understand what I mean. Joy comes from obedience to what we know is true. Okay? My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Now, that's an easy thing to say, and everyone knows that expression. But what does that lead you to think and reflect upon? God loves you in spite of all your faults. Okay. So we should ignore some of the faults of other people. Ooh, okay. Some it's really hard. <laughs> yes, some of really hard. Yeah. See, that's They're, right. That's, and that's the one that's, that's hard that's, for me. I have because some people just yeah. some people just have the wrong yeah ness to them. It's like you're trying to forgive them, you're trying to love them, but it, it's so hard. It's like, wait a minute, I don't want to be that person's friend. It's hard for me to love that person, but I'm trying to get it. Yeah, and I you, find myself. With the person I get from with, I always say to God, I don't, I don't wish him any harm. Right. I, I, I don't wish any harm or, or illness or anything like that. I'm sorry, I just. <laughs> but you can't be with that person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you don't have to like them to love them. Yes, I don't love them. <laughs> love, love, love is action. Love is our response, not necessarily what we feel. See, we always get a problem, and we associate love with feeling. Yeah. And sometimes love is action. I'm sure that while uh, Jesus was on the cross, feeling the pain of being whipped and whatever, um, he didn't feel too good at the time. But somewhere he was able to draw the strength. They say, forgive them. They don't realize. I can even give. I can even give somebody respect, but that doesn't mean I'm going to walk alongside them. Mm-hmm. And and then sometimes that in our loving of someone, um, we have to distance ourselves mm-hmm. um, because uh, it's best for us and also for them. Sometimes mm-hmm. the distancing of ourselves from someone who has recurring problems uh, will show up in other relationships too. And it's the only way that the Holy Spirit might be able to use that in order to uh, cause them to realize they've been cut off. You see? Uh, so that they have a chance and opportunity to return and remain in Christ's love. Yes. Sometimes it's the best thing you can do in a situation is to walk away from it. Yes. You know, give yourself a little time, time to think. Kind of talk to God and say, I'm walking away from this right now. And then when you return to it. Yeah. Very much. Um, verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. Uh, I think that's pure, and, you know, doesn't need explanation. We know what Jesus wants from us and we don't do it. We'll feel that absence. We'll feel that guilt. We'll feel that frustration. Unless, as he's going to talk about another time, we sub- suppress our conscience. And we can suppress our conscience of the voice of the Holy Spirit working in us so that we all of a sudden do not experience the inner voice. 
And then we are in danger of what the scriptures in a couple places call the, the sin of blasphemy or committing the sin that cannot be forgiven. It can't be forgiven because we are no longer responsive. We won't go there. We'll wait until that comes up. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. So you know, we know, what Jesus wants from us. If we don't, but it, but it, right, as a you servant, better get it back into the Word. As, as a servant, you're just following orders. You don't you don't care what why. You're just following the orders. That's so narrow-minded, oh, Charlie. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You, you know, you need to be open and more questioning. <laughs> and so, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Now, a lot of times this gets into discussion about predestination. Has God predestined Tammy? To be who she is and following of Jesus Christ. As, as you know, Cindy, as God predestined you, you know. Um, what it says here, though, if we read the context, I have predestined you, or chosen you, to bear fruit. So in other words, to be a Christian is to bear fruit. There's no other option. The fruit of that relationship with God will be evident in your life. It may not be as the same, you know, what Eddie shows as the fruit in his life may not be at the same level of Charlie's. We're at different places. But there still should be the evidence of that fruit. And fruit grows, you know, uh, at different times, at different stages. If I could take that analogy yes. a little further. So... The choosing there is not regarding salvation. The choosing there is that you are not a bear of fruit. It's expected of every believer to bear fruit. Then the Father will give you whatever I ask in my name. See, there that is again. If you want to bear fruit, whatever the particular circumstance, you'll be able to determine what fruit that God wants to you to produce in that circumstance. Okay? You ask, it's been... <clears throat> As far as you're concerned, that fruit would be in you. It may not change the circumstance for another person, because they have to respond, but it changes it for you. It means that we can walk away from circumstances you might regret they didn't turn out better. But we can look in the mirror and say, I did what Jesus wanted me to do. That is very important. That is fullness of joy. That is freedom not guilt that we carry around with us. And, uh, anyways, so we go to verse 10, 18. Uh, we talk about love, and this comes with some interesting questions. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, they will be obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Why is that? They wouldn't know they were doing wrong. That's right. So just Jesus coming and going through what he did reveals what we do wrong. Are we part of the crowd? Are we one of the Pharisees? Are we part of the Sanhedrin? Are we Pontius Pilate? Okay. How do we respond in our circumstances, in our lives? We don't have any excuse because we know the truth. How do we know the truth? Well, one of the ways we dig into this word and we, you know, we dig out those morsels that pertain to our lives. Um, they, he who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done uh, among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, now who's the counselor? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of what? Truth. Truth. 
who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So, um, why do you think, I think that was one of the questions, that Jesus <coughs> follows a discussion with his disciples about love, and loving and obeying his command to love, with all of a sudden this discussion about the world's going to hate you. Mm. Well, it hasn't made me feel too good. <laughs> well, it gives them, the, gives them the truth of what's going to happen. He knows how they're going to be accepted or not accepted by all the people around them. Okay. And he he has felt the hatred himself, and he knows that you know he's the vine, and they're attached to him, and so they're going to get the same kind of treatment. So... You know, if all of a sudden I get together with a group of people who have anger and hate, then I can go ahead and burn buildings. I can all ahead, get ahead and, and injure people. I can all, you know, but it's say what, I'm doing it for a right cause, but right? But to be a true disciple, it's what you're expressing out to the people you come into contact with. And if you give love, you might get love back. You have to show that you're different than... The normal crowd of the normal. What is the love of the world? Let me ask you. What is the love of the world? How is the how is the world love one another? A lot of it's just acceptance. We have to learn to accept people. Fairness. I don't think the world accepts people. Fairness. Kindness. We love to gather in groups. And the one thing that unites people together is hate. Mm -hmm. Why is that a stronger emotion than love? It seems to be. I mean, it gets a bigger response. Because love takes work. Mm -hmm. Hate is based upon emotion. I feel it, and I respond to it easily. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice a group of people that do things we know is wrong, and we understand that it's hate, but hate is what unites them. I think that's a little problem with our world, a little big problem. Now, I think hatred is growing more than love. That's right. Mm -hmm. I definitely, agree. Definitely. So, why would we be hated by this world? Because we love. Because we love. We won't buy in to hate. We will say, oh, you have a legitimacy. Uh, you may have a legitimate argument. Let's work on how we can, in a loving way, address that and resolve that. Hate doesn't like that. Sir? Hate wants you to buy into the hate. Certain individuals don't want to level the playing field. It makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. I want you to hear that hate is a unifying factor and if we don't join into the hate, then we are hated. We become the objects. Mm -hmm. and, that's of hate. and that's fueled by our news programming, Everything. TV, radio. I'm not just yeah, 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 I'm not yeah, yeah, making yeah, a political yeah, yeah, comment, yeah, but yeah, I'm looking no idea, at yeah, yeah. all the, the struggle right. that we have in our culture right, right now right. and trying to show what is our Christian response. You know, I will buy into legitimate argument and by in the Christian response is how we yeah. can resolve yeah. real issues and problems. It's to try to show love. But I can't buy into eight. It's to show love to one another, and sometimes we're not even, the hard thing is showing love to our own fellow Christians. So Jesus showed yes. love, yes. even to the Pharisees, yes. even to the outcasts, yes. even to the uh, Gentiles who are not part of God's people. Uh, Jesus, you know, the woman at the well. The woman at the well. And as well as the... Yeah, and Nicodemus. The kings and Pharisees. Yeah. And so what happens is that's it's easier to draw people together around hate rather than to be drawn around love. Love um, finds a way. Hate destroys. Is that because... Love we, finds a way. We don't make love a cause? Is that what it is? Love takes... The ability to suppress okay. our anger. Okay. It is love enables us to see the value in other persons, mm -hmm. even if we don't like what they do. Mm -hmm. 
love enables us to rise above those basic beast emotions okay, of the herd. I'll call it the herd. That, And so we're not willing to go along with the herd. So if you're not willing to go along with the mob, if you want to call it what they call it in the news, if you're not willing to go along with the hate, and you want more of a reasonable way, not saying we dismiss anyone's particular legitimate concern, but we point to more constructive means of being able to heal and help and whatever. Because we don't join into the hate, we're going to be hated. Mm -hmm. Jesus was hated. So he's preparing them for the fact, because if we're really remaining in him and following his way, we also will be hated. Doesn't the hate come from fear? Yes. Because people feared the power of Christ. And so therefore they hated him because they couldn't control him. Control, you mentioned, um, hate is built out of a desire to control. I've got to control every single outcome. I've got to be in control. And if someone doesn't allow me to be in control, their life is meaningless. They lose value to me. Whereas love says every person has value. I want that set out there because I think this is an important lesson. I think it's important for our time. And um, so we can expect us as Christ was hated that we will also be hated because we're taking a different path. We will not take extremes. We will call those who are lethargic, complacent, uh, we need to listen. We need to act. But we also will say the other side. No. That's just evil. Immoral. Mm -hmm. And what that means is both sides are going to hate us. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. I don't understand in some people they wallow in their hate. That's where they like to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, they... I don't know if they like that feeling or if they some feel hate is powerful. More in control, like you said, yeah. you know. And All I of a sudden, Charlie's to... angry, and so I have that anger, and we join together. Oh, do we love one another? Because we're standing up for the same thing that we hate. Yeah. There's power in that. That's why there could be some people that will go to uh, a mob or, you know, and I'm not against protest, but well, all of a sudden they get, they didn't necessarily intend to be violent. They get caught up. They get caught up in it. Um, yeah. What, what do you think happened when Jesus was finally arrested? Here they plotted him when he came into the city. All of a sudden the mob turned. They turned, they turned they against him. Yeah. Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him. You think they're not going to say that of us? Mm -hmm. Crucify them! Crucify them! Crucify the Christians. So I just that's just something we need to realize, and it's not just in a social situation, but we've got to realize that in our one-to-one, -one, face to face communication with people, maybe difficult people in difficult situations, the approach that we're going to take is going to be criticized for not going far enough. Just think how different the world would be if, if Pilate was a stronger person. Yeah. Mm. Right, because Pilate was now, the deciding that's man. That's very good. Now, I like that. Bonnie, take that with us today in anything. If, if uh, we decided that we're going to go God's way, Jesus' way, or are we, so are we willing to speak the truth in love, okay? are we willing to speak the truth, stand up for what is true? Because we know that in doing so, there's consequences. So I think that many Christians take the option, this may sound judgmental, but I think many Christians take the option, I'm just going to remain silent. I'm going to mind my own business. I, yeah. And I so because there are Christians who minded their own business, we find there were abuses in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. You know, people would say, "Oh, we hate racism," but they didn't do much. But that was, but that was, but that was, 
back in history. I don't think you're going to be able to do that now. I think yeah. we're getting a calling out. We're getting a calling out now, and we have to keep trying to keep politics out of it. I think after the election, we're going to see a lot more. Peter Manning writes us, is it wrong to get, oops, oh, <laughs> is it wrong to get or go away from those who are mean and hateful, or should we stay and try to change their attitude? I think that at some point you need to leave the environment and go, yeah. uh, and I agree. Now, we kind of talked upon, upon yeah, that. Sometimes our best response instead of engagement, because it's only going to be, so it's going to be more heated, as Tammy says. It's not going to be productive. It's going to draw you down. It's going to draw you down. But sometimes we have to withdraw from the hate. We have to withdraw. And that's one of the benefits of Christian fellowship. Because we still, we still deep down love them. It's just we have to let them work it out maybe a little bit differently. Is it coming to realization, I've realization. had to do that in, in being a counselor, yes. that I can listen to people, I can help them, to analyze why they feel the way they do, yes. what they feel, and why they feel the way they do. I can even suggest you know, what God might want them to, to respond, and but I can't make it happen for them. I can't save a marriage. I can't save a church. I can't save another believer in Christ that is going the wrong direction. I can influence... I can pray, I can do good to them, but I cannot save them. In some ways, if I try to save them, I prevent them from facing the consequences of their actions. So it's just like a drunk. Sometimes they always say a drunk has to hit rock bottom before there ever be a chance for change. So also there's some people Okay, you're going to hit rock bottom, and I'm not going to allow you to drag me down there with you. So you go ahead. And that's part of Al-Anon or part of some of these other, they, they're dealing with people that have these personal issues. They have to hit the end of the road. They have to hit the dead end side. And so oftentimes people that are involved with people that have those personal problems, we can tend to be uh, enable them by trying to rescue them. At some point in time, I've had to, to sit there and hear a wife say to a husband, uh, you know, I'm going to love you. To be in this house, this is what's got to happen. Because I love you. But if you want to be here, that's your choice. But just know, this is what has to happen if you're going to be here. Well, you don't love me. I love you. That takes a lot of strength. But I'm not going to be a part of your destruction. I that goes with not you know, alcoholism is a, an extreme example, but there's other ways that people show a frailty or sinfulness that we do not want to be a part of. Okay. I was going to say when you said that it immediately brought back uh, a couple that I knew, and he was a heavy drinker, and he came home one day and his wife had the whole house basically packed up. She said. I'm making this easy for you. Here's your choice. You can stay here alone or you can come with me and move into California. My parents have a small house that they said we can live in. So it's up to you. I'll be leaving in the morning. I mean, there wasn't a week or nothing. I mean, boxes were packed and everything. His clothes were still sitting in the closet. And she said, you know, you've got a few hours. You can be ready, but I'll be leaving in the morning. Oh, and I'll be taking the car. And he packed up his stuff and got there and got into alcohol and mamas and they had a, a good life. In fact, their son is a missionary. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so sometimes inactivity or letting things go. Yeah. But there's also a price. Mm -hmm. Because you can say that, but what happens if, if they don't go along? Right. You have to be willing to lose yes. the relationship. Yes. Mm -hmm in order to gain a healthy relationship. Let me say that. You have to, in a lot of different things, not just with alcoholism, but just someone that shows uh, anger or bitterness or gossip or whatever, you either become a part of it or you draw the line. I can't be a part of it. Well, if I, if I, if someone so gossips and I, I say, well, you know, I can't listen to that conversation. I can't be a part of this. Well, there's a consequence. Well, then I won't be your friend. Yeah. 
That's your choice. That takes strength. How do we find that strength? Because Jesus is more important to us. You have to love yourself else. enough to let them go. You have to love yourself enough to let them go. And you have to. And how do you have enough love for yourself? Because Jesus loves you. I don't. I can lose everything. That's hard for people to come to. But I can't lose Jesus. I have to say, I was anxious to get to Bible study and get to verse 18 and the world's hatred and stuff. Because I found that a real tongue twister when I read it. And, I, you know, and I, I probably read it three or four times and tried to take it little by little, but I didn't really need it. Are there any unanswered questions from your No, no, this has been good and good in the conversation between us. But, see, that's how Bible study helps me. Because sometimes I can read a passage and I go, hmm. You know, it just doesn't seem to gel yeah. with me, you know. Let's go into uh, 16, because we still have some time. I take us for an hour and a half, and so we've got 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, how about uh, uh, Charlie? Because I pick on Charlie because he's closer to the microphone, so you can be heard. Would you uh, start with 16? Verse 1. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. The time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering the service to God. Do such things because you have not known the Father or me. I have told you this. When the time comes, you will remember. I have warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. Okay, let's stop right there. The reason why I'm telling you to stop right there is because actually those uh, verses, those four verses from 16... Actually, go recall the pericope, a section that belongs together. Okay. okay, so that actually belongs to 18 as well. Okay, so he's telling them basically that there's going to be a time that the institutional religion, because even it's not just the world, but the world encroaches upon the institution of the church. Think down through church history about the Crusades, about the, um, you know, the problems between Catholics and, and Protestants or other type of things, or the witch hunts. So you can name all sorts of, of evils. Okay? What was behind them? Because it is that just because you call yourself by the name of Christ, and even though you go through the motions of religion, sometimes we worship the religion instead of God. And so in the name of religion, or in the name of God, we can serve God by killing him. KKK, and all those folks went to church. And they also felt they were doing God a favor by going out and lynching a black person. Go ahead, Charlie. Well, I was just going to say positively, what, you, what you've mentioned to us is the fact that the larger churches are breaking down into smaller home home, home churches mm -hmm. and because in my opinion is that the smaller groups are gaining more knowledge and gaining more knowledge of one another it's not that the the, the bigger church doesn't have an identity well the, and the other thing that that's coming about with Christianity is just plain that you're, you're slowly sensing that we busted ourselves apart for whatever reason through history, now there's a movement to try to get us all, all back together again. And some Christians are willing to do that, of, of, of going more to more than one location, and they've got others that say, no, I'm, I'm staying here, and I'm not going to talk to those Christians over there, for, which, is hurt, which is hurtful, and it's not, it's not Jesus and God likes so them. Yeah, there, like there's that. an importance of belonging to a community uh, because of the commitment uh, that we have to other Christians within that community. But at the same time, to recognize that community needs to recognize that we're the, not the only community. That's why you'll know it's like our witnesses last week. We had a witness of a Roman Catholic. Uh, we'll have different witnesses from people from different and, backgrounds. Uh, and, and through Voice of the Martyrs, we learned about Christianity in other countries. That's correct. So the church is universal. You'll notice when we did the Apostles' Creed, I changed the uh, a little word, apostolic and universal, as I put in there. Yeah, that's true. Because that's, what, because that's what Catholic means. 
in a, in a small C, not the capital C. But some people still can't translate the difference between a, cap, a capital C and a small C Catholic. Yes. yes. It's universal and apostolic. But what is important to realize is also when we had a little conversation when we were downstairs before we came in for the study about the signs of the end times. And one thing that is part of that, which we'll re we can read in Revelation, is one of the enemies of the true um, uh, the woman in Revelation that gives birth, you know, which is a symbol of the church, um, is the institution. If we look into Nazi Germany, we'll see that there was compromise and whatever, and that the confessional church in Germany actually became a part of Nazis' program. They might not have been uh, wanting to be, but in order to protect themselves, they became part of Hitler's program. You see, if we stand up for what is truth, and that's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer so the, did, as yeah. he went back to try to convince the, the church, right. do the, not give this power, and so it corrupted the, the church. Well, yeah, and the go, and the government would take take would take control of, of the church and the community. So in this day, what uh, Jesus was going to tell them is that their own faith, the institutional faith of the Hebrews, mm -hmm. okay centered in Jerusalem, was going to be an instrument of persecution. Okay. Okay. And then it was later also absorbed into, you know, the, other the culture, the government. But it was sad then, how could people of faith okay, persecute those who were teaching and loving and living love? Now the victory that we learned from church history in the early church is they at times during that spread persecution, they went before the gladiators. They were willingly gave up their lives. Fought, fought, they did not yeah. take up the sword. Fought fighting for Christianity. The number of Christians in the known world following Jesus grew so rapidly, they outnumbered the legions of Rome. If there were someone that would have said, pick up your sword, we're taken over. They could have done it, except it wouldn't represent Christ. Love others as I have loved you. How did he love you? And that is, he gave his life. And I made a mention during a Sunday service, uh, if I had the opportunity, it came to me one night, all of a sudden there's this protest, how about if we bake some cookies and we go down? <laughs> I'm not going to be involved in your protest. But how can we be an instrument of love and change during such a volatile time? I don't have easy answers for that, but I have learned, and I'll, sh and I'll share this little story from my, my daughters. I shared it before. I remember that she was walking home with some girls, and they were, they'd stop at what, oh, um, I can't remember what they called it now. But anyways, it was a, a little slam. It was the slam. Um, had been there from whatever was there before had been falling down. And all of a sudden, Bethany had the strength to be able to turn and, and made me very proud. Still proud of this day. She was able to say, well, I can't, I can't <clears throat> walk with you if you're going to talk this way. And so they said, okay, keep on walking. She surrendered some close friendships or what could have been close friendships for the sake of doing that which was right. The redeeming part of that is when all of a sudden each of those girls had pr trouble, guess who they turned to? Okay. But it was still a lonely road. And that's what I think Jesus is preparing us for, to be faithful and true is sometimes a lowly road. We don't necessarily give to extremes except for the extreme of, I'm going to stay close to Jesus. Remain in me, I'll remain in you. Do you see how those connect? What are you saying? Get your love from me. Others are going to reject you. Get your love from me. It is always there. No matter what you face, it is always there. That's what also, like you, the voice of the martyrs, those people are waiting to face horrendous yeah. things. 
but they're not willing to do it without Jesus. They're not willing to deny Jesus. Just to keep, just to keep themselves as Christians. Now we go to verse 5. That clock is wrong. So. Okay. I have to go make dinner. It's quarter to six. Okay. What are we having, Sharon? We're having a chance, Sharon. You're supposed to say, Sharon's surprise. You don't know yet, do you? Then he says, Now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I should be asking. Uh, and the answer to that is, where am I going? I'm going to the cross. Yes. Okay. Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you, but what grief are they filled? They're about Jesus? Or about the fact they're going to be persecuted? Or that they're losing him? I don't think they fully grasp that at this point yet. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, notice the name given to the counselor. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of, sin, of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, that's a complicated statement. you got to take that apart. Okay? So, what does the counselor do? He convicts the world of what? Guilt. So if I'm close to God, Christ, and I have the Holy Spirit in me, I can expect that I'm going to experience conviction. That's the whole purpose of my preaching on Sunday is hopefully someone's going to be convicted about something that's true, just in spite of me. Okay, But convince the world of guilt. The world. Now, does the world want to be convinced of its guilt? Would the House of Representatives or the Senate want me to stand in, in, in the box and give them a lecture on how they, they should behave and what God will right. from them. Which is what they need. What, 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 what they need. Christian, Christianity is, is scaring them. Because it is so loving. It is. He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now there's three things. Sin, sin righteousness, judgment. and judgment. Three things represent God. Okay? Sin and God don't go together. <laughs> Okay? Righteousness and God do. And judgment is just a reality. God says there's coming a time. And it's unavoidable. Unavoidable. Okay? So let's, he breaks it down even further. In regard to sin, because people do not believe in me. So sin is things that you do that are wrong. If I go and I just, because I don't like the way uh, Eddie's mustache looks, I go up and I just slap him in the face and Take out a razor and shave it off. I only pick on you because we pick on his mustache all the time. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, if I, if I go and I do that, which is unloving and hateful, okay? yes, that's sin. But Jesus expands sin to be what? Verse 9, what does it say? What's sin? They're wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. Okay, so disbelief in Jesus, when Jesus has revealed himself, the truth of the word, the truth of his actions, the miracles that were performed, the resurrection that is historical, if we do not believe in Jesus, though we've been exposed to and the all, truth, yeah. then what happens, that is sin. All those that are not believing that are sinners. That's right. Are not with Jesus and God. Right. So, there is anyone that we know there is no middle that of the road. Yes no. does not recognize Jesus for who he is and has to struggle with his lordship in their life, uh, is committed to sin. I still struggle with his lordship in my life because there's certain things I just don't want. I want to keep this for myself. And Jesus said, no way. But you're strong, <laughs> but you're strong because you've admitted it. It's the ones that don't admit it that are the weak ones. Mental health, spiritual health, <coughs> emotional health, all comes from self-awareness and realization of the truth. 
if, if therapy is this, okay, the best therapy, is to help someone realize, become self-aware of what's motivating them have to help and what they've done. Yourself first. That's right. So, uh, lack of faith in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father. Now, why is going to, his, to the Father is a conviction of righteousness? I know I'm not ask, asking you a question, right? <laughs> Or good. Um, we, get, we, get, get, we get strength from the Father. The Father is righteousness. Father, the Father is righteousness. And who goes to the Father? <laughs> who goes to the Father? Jesus goes to the Father. How come only Jesus goes to the Father? You can't follow me. How come only Jesus goes to the Father? Jesus, Jesus, is, Jesus, is the direct, Jesus is the direct Son and representation yes. of the Father that communicates it to us. And, it's, and the Holy Spirit is going to come to us. To, to, to bring us to the Father. Jesus is the only one who is righteous. The only human being who is truly righteous. And only the righteous can go to God. So he convicts the world of righteousness. So he says, Brian, Bonnie, Eddie, Tammy, Sharon, Cindy, <laughs> Charlie, all your righteousness from the Old Testament, all your righteousness, all your goodness, is nothing more than filthy rags. <gasps> All of us, also, no matter how good we try to be, as well as those in the world, are stinking sinners and need grace. We only come to the Father through Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. And if we want to be righteous, we have to be righteous in Him. He's the one that conveys righteousness to us, He's the one because I remain in him. He convicts me of sin. He is the one that prompts me to grow. Okay? That's important. Now, the third one is um, where you can see me, see me along. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. In other words, judgment has already come. The prince of this world, the world is following. Hate has already been condemned. If you follow hate, well, the leader, and you've chosen it, your and direction. Like, and like Bonnie said, the leader had the, had the ability to, to change things, and it, and it didn't get changed. So in other words, God doesn't send anyone to hell. We do that well enough on our own. We're just going to do 12, and we're going to end at 16, because we're probably going to lose power, and I'll lose the camera anyway. <laughs> I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. So... But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So in other words, by being in the spirit, we have more truth that we are able to comprehend. It has, yes. Not that it hasn't yes. been declared, yes. but the spirit is the way for us to understand. I can read this and, and justify hate, um, but the Holy Spirit, when we read this, cannot justify hate. It leads me into truth. So whenever I face a circumstance, I can turn to this word, and I can turn to the Holy Spirit, and it will lead me to the truth. Okay? He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. In other words, because he makes it known to us, we can do what is right, and we can bring glory to Jesus. And God. The Holy Spirit is our interpreter. Yes. yes. Very much so. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while you will see me no more. But then after a while you will see me. You'll see him because of the resurrection. And you'll see him because if you have experienced the Holy Spirit in your life, you experience Jesus. That's why he had to go. So when we experience Jesus, the Holy Spirit, we're actually experiencing the Spirit of Jesus. We're going to cut out there, and um, we're going to pick up with verse 17 of chapter 16 next week. Okay. And so if you look at some of the questions, uh, 16 is on there, and I'll put out some more for 17 as we seek to go over that. 17 is wonderful because it is truly, we call the Lord's Prayer, that's uh, that we pray, and that is a pattern of prayer.
But if you really want to see, see the prayer that Jesus prays, it's John 17. We're going to look at that. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you. Oh, you've got thunder, lightning, and rain outside. I hope it's not because we've done something wrong. <laughs> but gracious God, we do thank you for each season. We ask for safety for your people. We ask for uh, your coming to this world to restore sanity and justice. Until that time, we commit ourselves to being just and righteous and also reasonable as you would have us to live. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Everybody, one thing to know about cooking. Oh, I'm going to take them out in the rain. I'm going to do it. Would you like to put them in a Ziploc baggie or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put them in a Ziploc baggie. You don't take them home, I'll take them home. And you'll be sending out for Sunday? Yes. And you can put that in. I know you're